Mirror of the Sea by Joseph Conrad Overdue and Missing Often I turn with melancholy eagerness to the space reserved in the newspapers under the general heading of Shipping Intelligence. I meet there the names of ships I have known. Every year some of these names disappear. The names of old friends. Tempe Passati the different divisions of that kind of news are set down in their order, which varies but slightly in its arrangement of concise headlines. And first comes speakings, reports of ships met and signaled at sea, name, port, where from, where bound for, so many days out, ending frequently with the words, all well. Then come wrecks and casualties. A longish array of paragraphs, unless the weather has been fair and clear and friendly to ships all over the world. On some days there appears the heading overdue, an ominous threat of loss and sorrow trembling yet in the balance of fate. There is something sinister to a seaman in the very grouping of the letters which form this word, clear in its meaning and seldom threatening in vain. Only a very few days more, appallingly few to the hearts which had set themselves bravely to hope against hope, three weeks, a month later, perhaps, the name of ships under the blight of the overdue heading shall appear again in the column of shipping intelligence, but under the final declaration of missing. The ship or bark or brig, so-and-so, bound from such a port with such and such cargo for such another port, having left at such and such a date, last spoken at sea on such a day, and never having been heard of since was posted today as missing. Such in its strictly official eloquence is the form of funeral orations on ships that perhaps wearied with a long struggle or in some unguarded moment that may come to the readiest of us had let themselves be overwhelmed by a sudden blow from the enemy. Who can say? Perhaps the men she carried had asked her to do too much, had stretched beyond breaking point the enduring faithfulness which seems wrought and hammered into that assemblage of iron ribs and plating, of wood and steel and canvas and wire, which goes to the making of a ship, a complete creation, endowed with character, individuality, qualities, and defects, by men whose hands launch her upon the water, and that other men shall learn to know with an intimacy surpassing the intimacy of man with man, to love with a love nearly as great as that of man for woman, and often as blind in its infatuated disregard of defects. There are ships which bear a bad name, but I have yet to meet one whose crew, for the time being, failed to stand up angrily for her against every criticism. One ship, which I call to mind now, had the reputation of killing somebody every voyage she made. This was no calumny, and yet I remember well somewhere far back in the late seventies that the crew of that ship were if anything rather proud of her evil fame as if they had been an utterly corrupt lot of desperados glorying in their association with an atrocious creature we belonging to other vessels moored all about the circular quay in sydney used to shake our heads at her with a great sense of the unblemished virtue of our own well-loved ships. I shall not pronounce her name. She is missing now, after a sinister, but from the point of view of her owners, a useful career extending over many years, and I should say, across every ocean of our globe, having killed a man for every voyage, and perhaps rendered more misanthropic by the infirmities that come with years upon a ship she had made up her mind to kill all hands at once before leaving the scene of her exploits. A fitting end, this, to a life of usefulness and crime, 
and a last outburst of an evil passion supremely satisfied on some wild night, perhaps, to the applauding clamor of wind and wave. How did she do it? And the word missing, there is a horrible depth of doubt and speculation. Did she go quickly from under the men's feet, or did she resist to the end, letting the sea batter her into pieces, star her butts, wrench her frame, load her with an increasing weight of salt water, and dismasted, unmanageable, rolling heavily, her boats gone, her decks swept, had she wearied her men half to death with the unceasing labor at the pumps, before she sank with them like a stone. However such a case must be rare, I imagine a raft of some sort could always be contrived, and even if it saved no one, it would float on and be picked up, perhaps conveying some hint of the vanished name. Then the ship would not be, properly speaking, missing. She would be lost with all hands. And in that distinction, there is a subtle difference, less horror and a less appalling darkness. The unholy fascination of dread dwells in the thought of the last moments of a ship reported as missing in the columns of the shipping gazette. Nothing of her ever comes to light. No grating, no life buoy, no piece of boat or branded oar to give a hint of the place and date of her sudden end. The shipping gazette does not even call her lost with all hands. She simply remains missing. She has disappeared enigmatically into a mystery of fate as big as the world, where your imagination of a brother sailor, of a fellow servant, and lover of ships may range unchecked. And yet sometimes one gets a hint of what the last scene may be like in the life of a ship and her crew, which resembles a drama in its struggle against a great force bearing it up, formless, ungraspable, chaotic, and mysterious as fate. It was on a gray afternoon in the lull of a three days gale that had left the southern ocean tumbling heavily upon our ship under a sky hung with rags of clouds that seemed to have been cut and hacked by the keen edge of a sou'west gale. Our craft, a Clyde-built bark of 1,000 tons, rolled so heavily that somewhat aloft had carried away. No matter what the damage was, but it was serious enough to induce me to go aloft myself with a couple of hands and the carpenter to see the temporary repairs properly done. Sometimes we had to drop everything and cling with both hands to the swaying spars, holding our breath in fear of a terribly heavy roll, and wallowing as if she meant to turn over with us, the bark, her decks full of water, her gear flying in bites, ran at some ten knots an hour. We had been driven far south, much farther than way than we had meant to go, and suddenly, up there in the slings of the foreyard in the midst of our work, I felt my shoulder gripped with such force in the carpenter's powerful paw that I positively yelled with unexpected pain. The man's eyes stared close in my face, and he shouted, Look, sir, look, what's this? Pointing ahead with his other hand. At first I saw nothing. The sea was one empty wilderness of black and white hills. Suddenly, half concealed in the tumult of the foaming rollers, I made out a wash, something enormous, rising and falling, something spreading out like a burst of foam, but with a more bluish, more solid look. It was a piece of an ice flow, melted down to a fragment, but still big enough to sink a ship and floating lower than any raft, right in our way, as if ambushed among the waves with murderous intent. There was no time to get down on deck. I shunted from aloft till my head was ready to split. I was heard aft, and we managed to clear the sunken floe 
which had come all the way from the southern ice cap to have a try at our unsuspecting lives. Had it been an hour later, nothing could have saved the ship, for no eye could have made out in the dusk that pale piece of ice swept over by the white crested waves. And as we stood near the taffrail side by side, my captain and I, looking at it hardly discernible already, but still quite close to on our quarter, he remarked in a meditative tone, but for the turn of that wheel just in time, there would have been another case of a missing ship. Nobody ever comes back from a missing ship to tell how hard was the death of the craft and how sudden and overwhelming the last anguish of her men. Nobody can say with what thoughts, with what regrets, with what words on their lips they died, but there is something fine in the sudden passing away of these hearts from the extremity of struggle and stress and tremendous uproar, from the vast, unrestful rage of the surface to the profound peace of the depths sleeping untroubled since the beginning of ages. But if the word missing brings all hope to an end and settles the loss of the underwriters, the word overdue confirms the fears already born in many homes ashore and opens the door of speculation in the market of risks. Maritime risks, be it understood, there is a class of optimists ready to reinsure an overdue ship at a heavy premium. But nothing can insure the hearts on shore against the bitterness of waiting for the worst. For if a missing ship has never turned up within the memory of seamen of my generation, the name of an overdue ship, trembling as it were on the edge of the fatal heading, has been known to appear as arrived. It must blaze up indeed with a great brilliance the dull printer's ink expended on the assemblage of the few letters that form the ship's name to the anxious eyes, scanning the page in fear and trembling, and it is like the message of reprieve from the sentence of sorrow suspended over many a home, even if some of the men in her have been the most homeless mortals that you may find among the wanderers of the sea. The reinsurer, the optimist, of ill luck and disaster slaps his pocket with satisfaction. The underwriter, who had been trying to minimize the amount of impending loss, regrets his premature pessimism. The ship has been stauncher, the sky is more merciful, the seas less angry, or perhaps the men on board of a finer temper than he has been willing to take for granted. The ship so-and-so, bound to such a port and posted as overdue, has been reported yesterday as having arrived safely at her destination. Thus run the official words of the reprieve addressed to the hearts ashore lying under a heavy sentence, and they come swiftly from the other side of the earth, over wires and cables, for your electric telegraph is a great alleviator of anxiety. Details, of course, shall follow, and they may unfold a tale of narrow escape, of steady ill luck, of high winds and heavy weather, of ice, of interminable calms, or endless head gales, a tale of difficulties overcome, of adversity defied by a small knot of men upon the great loneliness of the sea, a tale of resource, of courage, of helplessness, perhaps. Of all ships disabled at sea, a steamer who has lost her propeller is the most helpless, and if she drifts into an unpopulated part of the ocean, she may soon become overdue. The menace of the overdue and the finality of missing come very quickly to steamers whose life, fed on coals and breathing the black breath of smoke into the air, goes on in disregard of wind and wave. Such a one, a big steamship too, whose working life has been a record of faithful keeping, 
time from land to land in disregard of wind and sea once lost her propeller down south on her passage out to New Zealand. It was the wintry, murky time of cold gales and heavy seas. With the snapping of her tail shaft, her life seemed suddenly to depart from her big body, and from a stubborn, arrogant existence, she passed all at once into the passive state of a drifting log. A ship sick, with her own weakness, has not the pathos of a ship vanquished in a battle with the elements wherein consists the inner drama of her life. No seaman can look without compassion upon a disabled ship, but to look at a sailing vessel with her lofty spars gone is to look upon a defeated but indomitable warrior. There is defiance in the remaining stumps of her masts, raised up like maimed limbs against the menacing scowl of a stormy sky. There is high courage and the upward sweep of her lines towards the bow, and as soon as on a hastily rigged spar a strip of canvas is shown to the wind to keep her head to sea, she faces the waves again with an unsubdued courage. The efficiency of a steamship consists not so much in her courage as in the power she carries within herself. It beats and throbs like a pulsating heart within her iron ribs, and when it stops, the steamer, whose life is not so much a contest as the disdainful ignoring of the sea, sickens and dies upon the waves. The sailing ship, with her unthrobbing body, seemed to lead mysteriously a sort of unearthly existence, bordering upon the magic of the invisible forces, sustained by the inspiration of life-giving and death-dealing winds. So that big steamer, dying by a sudden stroke, drifted an unwieldy corpse away from the track of other ships. And she would have been posted really as overdue, or maybe as missing, had she not been sighted in a snowstorm vaguely like a strange rolling island by a whaler going north from her polar cruising ground. There was plenty of food on board, and I don't know whether the nerves of her passengers were at all affected by anything else than the sense of interminable boredom or the vague fear of that unusual situation. Does a passenger ever feel the life of the ship in which he is being carried like a sort of honorable bale of highly sensitive goods. For a man who has never been a passenger, it is impossible to say, but I know that there is no harder trial for a seaman than to feel a dead ship under his feet. There is no mistaking that sensation, so dismal, so tormenting, and so subtle, so full of unhappiness and unrest. I could imagine no worse eternal punishment for evil seamen who die unrepentant upon the earthly sea than that their souls should be condemned to man the ghosts of disabled ships, drifting forever across a ghostly and tempestuous ocean. She must have looked ghostly enough, that broken-down steamer, rolling in that snowstorm, a dark apparition in a world of white snowflakes to the staring eyes of that whaler's crew. Evidently they didn't believe in ghosts, for on arrival into port her captain unromantically reported having sighted a disabled steamer in latitude somewhere about fifty degrees south, and a longitude still more uncertain. Other steamers came out to look for her, and ultimately towed her away from the cold edge of the world into a harbor with docks and workshops where, with many blows of hammers, her pulsating heart of steel was set going again to go forth presently in the renewed pride of her strength, fed on fire and water, breathing black smoke into the air, pulsating, throbbing, shouldering its arrogant way against the great rollers in blind disdain of winds and sea. 
The track she had made when drifting while her heart stood still within her iron ribs looked like a tangled thread on the white paper of the chart. It was shown to me by a friend, her second officer, and that surprising tangle there were words in minute letters, gales, thick fog, ice, written by him here and there as memoranda of the weather. She had interminably turned upon her tracks. She had crossed and recrossed her haphazard path till it resembled nothing so much as a puzzling maze of penciled lines without a meaning. But in that maze there lurked all the romance of the overdue and a menacing hint of missing. We had three weeks of it, said my friend. Just think of that. How did you feel about it? I asked. He waved his hand as much as to say, it's all in the day's work, but then abruptly, as if making up his mind. I'll tell you, towards the last, I used to shut myself up in my berth and cry. Cry? Shed tears, he explained briefly, and rolled up the chart. I can answer for it. He was a good man, as good as ever stepped upon a ship's deck, but he could not bear the feeling of a dead ship under his feet, the sickly, disheartening feeling which the men of some overdue ships that come into harbor at last under a jury rig must have felt combated and overcome in the faithful discharge of their duty.